I'm here to welcome you to this, the 29th annual Norma Berryhill Lecture. Uh, this is a lectureship that was created under Dean Stuart Bondurant in 1985, and each year it allows us the opportunity to come together in a fall convocation, if you will, for the School of Medicine to honor one of our distinguished faculty members and to salute their work and to talk about what binds us together as a medical school and community here in Chapel Hill. Please, again, be welcomed. We're glad that you're here. Uh, there are a number of people that I'd like to recognize. Uh, Ms. Berryhill's granddaughter, Jane, is here, and her husband, David Meyer. We welcome you all. Uh, Jane's mother, Kat Berryhill Williams, uh, is not able to be with us today, but we send greetings to her. Uh, also, we had uh, invited uh, Chancellor Folt, Carol Folt, to be with us, and uh, Chancellor uh, called this afternoon to say she was a bit under the weather and not able to uh, speak this evening, so would I please bring her greetings to you, and so I do that, and we look forward to welcoming her with us uh, next year. There are others that I'd like to recognize tonight. Uh, Rick Worf, Dr. Worf is the president of the Medical Alumni Association. He will be speaking shortly. Uh, Dr. Stuart Barnderant, former dean of the medical school. Uh, Dr. Jeff Haupt, uh, also former dean of the med school, and his wife, Corrine. Uh, Burton Fox, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Tintinale's husband. Burton, we're glad that you're here. And their children, and would you each please stand? Dr. Ann Tintinale, Dr. Elizabeth uh, Tintinale, John Tintinale, and his fiancee, Patty Webster, Joshua Fox, and Gemma Fox. We welcome you all. Thank you for being here. I, in the back of your program is listed the previous pre presenters of this distinguished lectureship from 1985 to 19, uh, excuse me, to 2012. And I would just ask each of you who are with us tonight, former Berry Hill lecturers, would you please stand so that we can give you honorary uh, applause. Please take a moment to read in the brochure the uh, remarks about this outstanding woman, your grandmother, Ms. Norma Berryhill, who played such an important role in the life of our medical school. She was, of course, the wife, the spouse, the partner of Dr. Reese Berryhill, who was dean of our medical school from 1941 to 1964, 24 years. And across that period, Dr. Barry Hill was responsible for immense change in our school, taking it above all from a two-year to a four-year medical school, growing the size of its operation, recruiting faculty from all over the country, and building programs in a variety of areas that have now stood us in good stead decades later. Across that period, he was ably supported and helped and in her own right, she created a community environment for the School of Public Health. That was Dr. Mrs. Norma Berryhill. And though I didn't have the pleasure of knowing her directly myself, I've heard lots of stories about what Mrs. Berryhill did and the important role she played in the life of our school. I'd like to just quote, uh, read a quote from Dean Bondurant who said, Mrs. Berry Hill was the source of great influence on the development of the School of Medicine and its people over many decades. Her clear insights and high standards combi combined with an unfailing interest in the lives and careers of faculty, students, and their families made her a true co-founder of the School of Medicine. So tonight we honor her uh, uh, contributions, honor her memory, salute all of the faculty of the School of Medicine, and in particular, Dr. Tintinale, whom I'll introduce in just a minute. Please do welcome, though, Dr. Rick Worf, who's going to bring greetings on behalf of our Alumni Association.
Good evening. Uh, I am uh, Rick Worf, and I'm the president of the uh, Medical Alumni Association. And uh, this position affords me the great uh, privilege of welcoming everyone on behalf of the alumni. Uh, this celebration of our school, its history, its enduring presence, and its exciting future is, uh, as Dean Roper said, the largest uh, convocation of the medical community at the university aside from graduation. And for good reason. We celebrate the life and contributions of Norma Berry Hill, a wife of Dr. Walter Reese Berry Hill, who was the Dean of the School of Medicine from 1941 to 1964. Dr. Berry Hill and Mrs. Berry Hill worked tirelessly, hand in glove, to usher our school through the difficult process of transitioning from a two-year to a fully accredited four-year institution. Process that was uh, completed in the middle of Dr. Barry Hill's tenure as dean in 1952. It has been said that Dr. Barry Hill took care of the students and the staff, and Mrs. Barry Hill took care of the wives the, and the families of the student uh, residents and faculty. Many of these were members of the greatest generation who were returning from service in World War II and were beginning the process of getting on with their lives and pursuing training in medicine. Norma Berryhill helped establish an atmosphere of collegiality and graciousness that pervades our school even today. Her home was always open, and in, she entertained students, faculty, and prospective faculty with her characteristic Southern hospitality that is legendary even today. Applicants who are accepted for interviews at our school uh, remark that this place is different from other schools they visited. I have to believe that the Berry Hills have something to do with that impression. The list of former lecturers at this gathering reads like a who's who of the medical school. One or more of these great physicians has touched the life of every graduate of this institution, and by so doing, has influenced the lives and well-being of thousands of patients throughout North Carolina, the United States, and the world. Tonight, we add another name to the list of individuals who continue the tradition of excellence and caring embodied by the Berry Hills beginning 72 years ago. So without further ado, I will call on Dean Roper to introduce our Berry Hill lecturer for 2013. Dean. Thanks, Dr. Worf. Dr. Judy E. Tentinelli is Professor and Chair Emeritus of the UNC Department of Emergency Medicine. She's also Adjunct Professor in the Department of Health Policy and Administration in the UNC Gilling School of Global Public Health and is lecturer in medical journalism at the UNC School of Journalism and Mass Communications. Dr. Tintinale grew up in Detroit and received her undergraduate degree at the University of Detroit, her medical degree from Wayne State University, and she served an internship in internal medicine at Detroit General Hospital. She continued her residency in internal medicine at the University of Michigan Medical Center because they didn't have a residency in emergency medicine at the time, but she knew even then that she wanted to spend her career working in this field. She joined the faculty at Wayne State University where she was associate professor of emergency medicine, and over the next several years her held a series of responsible positions in healthcare facilities in the state of Michigan. In 1991, we were fortunate that she came to UNC as the founding chair of our school's newly created Department of Emergency Medicine, and she chaired that department for 16 years, establishing UNC's highly regarded emergency medicine residency program, and for 10 years serving as medical director of the emergency department at UNC Hospitals. She edited the first emergency medicine textbook, then called Emergency Medicine, A Study Guide, in 1980, 
And that text has remained the field's standard text. She literally wrote the book on emergency medicine. <clears throat> In 2007, the book was retitled Emergency Medicine, a Comprehensive Study Guide. It's been published in nine languages and is the most widely used emergency medicine textbook in the world. She has a number of professional honors, including election to the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences and the North Carolina Institute of Medicine. She was named a hero of emergency medicine by the American College of Emergency Medicine, is a life fellow of the American College of Emergency Physicians, and is an honorary emeritus member of the Council of Emergency Medicine Directors. Earlier this year, she received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the UNC School of Medicine Academy of Educators, which is all about promoting excellence in teaching. One of her colleagues here at UNC said that there are few faculty members who have so single-handedly helped to shape both the School of Medicine and an entire field the way she has. She has spent a career largely here at UNC building a training program, a department, and perhaps most important, a sense of community. Over the past decade, Dr. Tintinelli has been a passionate and influential ambassador for the specialty of emergency medicine worldwide. She has visited every continent except Antarctica, educating healthcare providers about critically ill and injured patients. For all these reasons, it's very fitting that she be honored as the 2013 Norma Berryhill Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Tintinelli. Well, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And giving a Berry Hill lectureship is exciting. It's an honor, and it's a very significant event for me personally and for our department. And this gives me the opportunity to thank and acknowledge those who helped us develop, and also to tell you the story about emergency medicine and about emergency medicine at UNC, where we started, where we've come, and where we hope to go. Now, I've gotten a lot of emails uh, from faculty I know and those who don't know saying, what, what is this Rapunzel's Tower? Well, let's see. Are you ready for more? I'm making room. There are so many medical specialties. Let's see. A, anesthesiology. S, family medicine. I, internal medicine. O, orthopedics. And P, pediatrics. That's that. And there's S for surgery. And then there's emergency medicine. Wow. It's like they all exist in different worlds. <gasps> Remember when Billy was trying to work with you and couldn't find your tower? He did once I was able to open the window and shout his name. And then we talked. <gasps> then that's the answer. Communication, sharing, trust. Mm. Um, let's see if we can get the towers to work together. I don't no. know. Wait, emergency medicine works with specialists every day. Let's, let's ask, ask Dr. Dr. Tintinelli. Well, our two Rapunzels, 
Katie Harrigan and Caroline Scholar had a tough time even connecting two towers. So imagine what it was like coming to UNC and trying to integrate emergency medicine into a well-revered, well-respected medical center with a lot of domains, towers of specialties existing. We were very warmly received. As a matter of fact, Chris Fordham came to our very first emergency medicine faculty meeting. But it really took many years for the institution to really understand how integrative our specialty was and how important integration was for the future of the institution as well as for our specialty. Now, imagine a community without an emergency department. If you had a heart attack, if you had a stroke, if you were in an auto accident, where would you go for care? And who would be taking care of you? Well, the way things started out up until the 1970s, there were actually no trained emergency physicians. So emergency medicine started because there was a need for trained doctors in the ER, not moonlighters, not interns. And we also needed a specialty for training, for patient care, and also to give us the leap into professional advancement. Beginning in the 70s, we had many treatments becoming more and more available for time-sensitive conditions. So it was important that you knew how you had individuals who could diagnose conditions and treat them properly. And then also by the 1970s, lifestyle changes had come upon us in the U.S. There was a lot of geographic movement. There was a need for care after hours. And there was the emergence of psychosocial medical problems, and they all had to go somewhere. Another thing that led to the development of emergency medicine was the transformation from what we call vertical care to horizontal care. So in the old days, if you had an accident, if you had a broken bone, you would be taken directly to an orthopedic inpatient service. If you were a woman with abdominal pain, the gynecologist would take care of you on their inpatient service. Headache, neurology, don't feel well, internal medicine. So, <laughs> sorry guys. <laughs> I didn't think it was funny when I prepared it, but. <laughs> At any rate, beginning in the 70s, it became evident that a different way of delivering care was needed so that anyone with any complaint, any age, any day or time of the day, any day of the year, would be able to receive horizontal care, which is emergency medicine. So how is emergency medicine different from other specialties? Well, it thought of a unique way to solve the problem of ED care, and that was 24-hour coverage, but using shift scheduling. It required close collaboration with all specialties and practices, and we had to develop a detailed curriculum so that we would be able to manage all complaints in all age groups. And still today, emergency care is the only health care in the U.S. to which everyone has a legal right, independent of the ability to pay, and this was codified by the EMTALA regulations in 1986. UNC Hospitals was built in 1952, UNC Memorial Hospital. It may surprise you to know it was built without an emergency room, let alone emergency department. Everyone thought, well, why would someone come to a tertiary care center to Chapel Hill for emergency care? But they started coming. They came into the front door of the hospital saying they had an illness. The person sitting at the front desk would page what they thought was the appropriate resident who would then come down, find a place to examine the patient, and take care of the problem. Well, people kept coming. So finally, a room was dedicated, and now a nurse was scheduled in that room 24-7. So if a patient came in, you would see the nurse, who would have a better idea of your complaint and would know what resident to call to take care of you. And then finally, people kept coming and coming and coming. So on the ground floor, next door to the driveway by Burnett Womack, and I think that was selected because it had a loading dock, a series of rooms were transformed into the emergency department. 
So these are some of our archive slides. You see in the closest panel, that is triage. You see what the original rooms look like with the drapes. You see a patient being resuscitated. And then you see in the far corner, the registration room, or registration area of the ED. We had a pediatric room, tiny for tiny children. We had a psych room that actually appalled me. Coming from southeastern Michigan, we were used to a lot of very uh, violent situations in the emergency department. And the psych room was a small room, all glassed in, with nice furniture and with nice little vases and stuff. And <laughs> the psychiatry attending himself would call down and see the patients and then take care of them or make the disposition in the ED. And you see on this slide, uh, for those of you who remember Thomas Watson, who just retired after 50 years as our head clerk in the, in the ED, and I'm sure if I have many medical students here, residents, faculty, they all know Thomas, he volunteered for that picture in the old trauma room. And then next to that is the regular medical resuscitation room. So there's a lot of stuff in the trauma room, and in the old ED, if you look, we had everything that was necessary. All of the equipment, you know, now we have fancier monitors and a bit more room, but I don't want anyone to think that the care that was given, because the ED was small and not, at that time and perhaps not as spacious, I don't want you to think the care wasn't anything but top notch, because it really was. And then we moved on a bit. Some of you may remember Fred Hansen, who was in the upper corner there. He was brought in by George Sheldon to organize the emergency department after it became built as a series of rooms. And what Fred did was, first of all, he started the first ACLS and ATLS courses that were ever given in the institution. Well, he organized them. And then Fred was also responsible for making sure that we had, there were enough physicians to really work in the ED. And at that time, they were usually moonlighting fellows or young faculty at UNC who wanted to supplement their income. And they were internists or surgeons. The smiling face there is Tony Morris, who was here for a year before I came. And uh, he was my right hand. He was the vice chief of the department for 10 years. He is now a medical director of one of the major European pharmaceutical research firms. And you see old air care. Those people look so sad. They were in the basement of UNC hospitals until we built the new emergency department and moved to the top of the neurosciences building. And that was our emergency entrance not as fancy as today. Well, let's look a little bit at the beginnings of emergency medicine uh, all around the country. So we'll start with the 1970s. The US population at that time was about 200 million. And emergency medicine started simultaneously in two small communities, one in Pontiac, Michigan, and one in Arlington, Virginia. And there were two family physicians who had a small group, and they became very disturbed and really appalled at the level of emergency care that was available in their communities at that time. As was typical, if you were credentialed in your hospital, part of your job was to cover the ED at a scheduled time. So if you were a surgeon and an accident came in, it was great. But if you were a surgeon and it was a heart attack, it was not so great. If you were an ophthalmologist, you might not be prepared to handle children or general medical problems. So in Pontiac and Arlington, Virginia, these two physicians took their own groups and they decided to staff the emergency department full time and that was really the beginning. In 1975, the first emergency medicine resident graduated from the University of Cincinnati. He is still working. He's in Augusta, Georgia right now. And what he did was he went to the dean at Cincinnati. Well, let me go back a little bit. When he was a senior medical student, one of his moonlighting jobs was to work in an ER in Kentucky. He was a senior medical student. He got paid to cover the ER and the inpatient unit and the emergencies that came up. 
And he realized he did not know anything. So he went to the dean and said, I want to be an emergency physician. Let me design my own curriculum, and I'll report to you directly. And that was how our very first residency in emergency medicine began. By the late 1970s, there were three emergency medicine residencies in North Carolina, at Carolinas Medical Center, Wake Forest Baptist Hospital, and ECU. And they remain, of course, very prestigious programs. They've got a battle with us because we're a little bit better, but uh, they are very good programs. By the 1990s, our U.S. population had gone up to 250,000. We had the groundbreaking for our new emergency department, and our ED visits at that time were 35,000 a year. That's basically what we had in this small ED in UNC Memorial Hospital. But due to the work and vision of Dean Bondurant, UNC was the 25th full academic emergency medicine department in the U.S., and we began our residency program in 1995 with six residents and eight faculty. Now, it's easy to build something good if you have shoulders to stand on. And I want to just share with you some of the acknowledgement of my favorite people who really, really helped us a lot. Stuart Bondurant, our statesman, our visionary. We were at a fork in the road at that time and Stewart chose the right fork. He built the ACC, convinced a lot of cynical faculty that that was the place we had to move in order to bring us into the modern world of medicine, built the neurosciences hospital, the women's hospital, and the children's hospital. So that was a big fork in our career at UN, in our institution at UNC. But if I were to describe Stuart, I would, I would say he is loyal and he is personal. He was always very loyal to people who had worked hard for UNC and had done a good job. But he was very personal. I would get notes from Stuart. Congratulations, you published an article. Your department has done some research. And that really helped us out a lot. So thank you, Stuart. And I've tried to emulate those behaviors throughout my career that you showed me how to do. I do wish George Sheldon were here so that I could publicly acknowledge him and thank him for everything that he has done. He has done a lot, and I'll bet most people here don't, don't even know that. He is a leader. He was president of everything in surgery. And actually, we were all, almost contemporaneously, I was president of the American Board of Emergency Medicine about the same period that George Sheldon was president of the American Board of Surgery. And at that time, we were trying, there were, there were still a lot of disagreements with the American Board of Medical Specialties, and emergency medicine was trying to become a primary board. We had been a conjoint board in 1979. Well, George Sheldon was really one of the key individuals who helped teach uh, ABMS that in order to have a good trauma system, you needed good EMS and you needed good emergency physicians. And he was really one of the key individuals who laid the foundation for the specialty of emergency medicine as we know it now. He was very personable. I remember calling him and saying, George, you know, you have a big department show me, how, how do you do this budget thing? And he brought me in and he showed me all the numbers and honestly, I didn't know what they meant at that time, but he, he was very great. And he used to take me drinking to the patio. Well, wait, <laughs> drinking is a loose usage of the term. We would meet on occasion with other faculty members uh, to have a few drinks in the patio at the Carolina Inn. <laughs> so I, I miss George and uh, I wish you were here. I miss another guy, George Johnson. And uh, George, um, he was a warm, warm individual who took me under his wing. He was one of the leaders of EMS in the state. And he would pick me up, take me to all the EMS meetings, make sure that I knew who the people were and help me make made the right connections. 
He was also involved really earlier on with emergency medicine, but not in the way that we know it now. He was a member of the University Association for Emergency Medicine, UAEM, which is the progenitor of our major academic society, the Society of Academic Emergency Medicine. UAEM was founded by academic surgeons who were thrust with the responsibility, probably most of them against their will, of managing their academic emergency department. So I met George very early on when he was president of the organization, and I remember thinking, he really wants to meet an emergency physician, a young ER doc, but he did, and he was very interested learning about this specialty, and I never believed that years later I would be working with him again. Now, everyone here knows Bob Cephalo. We had a couple of things in common. I had done some research on trauma in pregnancy, and we both had Italian last names. So we had a normal bonding right from the beginning. And as the head of graduate medical education at UNC, he was very supportive and very helpful and always positive about our emergency medicine residents. He would call me up and say, Judith, one of your residents was on OP, and they were so good. You're doing such a good, good thing training these individuals, and we're getting great candidates to UNC. And then one day, uh, I sat down again with Bob, and uh, he said, Judith, I've got to tell you something. You want to know what's going to get you ahead? Patience and persistence. Patience and persistence. With that, you will get everything. I said, Bob, OK, persistent I am, but patience? That, that is not in the vocabulary of an emergency physician. But those words really resonated with me. He was right. And I always tell them to my students, residents, and faculty, patience and persistence. Stan Mandel. He is the consummate politician. I don't know if Stan is here today. He looks so stern in this picture. But he, he was, at least for me, not in any way a stern guy. He was a listener, and then he was a doer. He was also probably my talk therapist. So about every two weeks or so, we would get together in his office. We would talk about the efficiencies, inefficiencies, things to do better at UNC hospitals. And most of the time, he came and did those things. Now, at, the, at that time, in the early 90s, UNC was sort of a, I would say, a homegrown uh, type of institution. It was very dependent upon individuals, and uh, you would really try to match or um, fit your practice to the behaviors of individuals. There weren't policies, there weren't procedures, there weren't a lot of standardized ways for doing things. And Stan recognized that, and he, he helped make a lot of changes at that time that still carry on today. We have a very active and efficient transfer system now. And the reason that started was I went to Stan. I said, Stan, all these, you know, there is, it was a resident-run institution. People are calling in from all over the state, and they want to transfer a patient here. And they call the operator, and the operator puts them in touch with the resident. And the hospital census at that time was running in the 70s. It wasn't, but it was hard to get transferred to UNC hospitals. So Stan was able to change that almost overnight in a way that I think in emergency medicine we have a little bit of regrets now because the vast majority of transfer calls do come in to us in the emergency department. They came in at the beginning because we were the only faculty in-house 24-7. So we have a lot to thank Stan for. And my last favorite, but really these are not my only favorites, but my favorite favorites, is Tom Griggs. So Tom Griggs is our community leader. He is a policeman. He is a fireman. He is a sheriff. And if I added in a few extra words, it's because everybody believes all these things about Tom. He was also the medical director of the State Highway Patrol. 
He founded the South Orange EMS Rescue Squad, and he was the head of the um, Orange County EMS unit, and he was the head when I came on. But he worked with us. He understood that eventually the reins would have to be handed over to an emergency physician. He broke in Greg Mears, and then from Greg Mears, we've moved to Jane Bryce to run our EMS system. But we owe all of that beginning to Tom Griggs. So thank you all who helped us out. Now, of course, these weren't the only individuals that were helpful to emergency medicine. A lot of different people did small things, big things. Many, many departments were very, very helpful. But these were all my friends and made a big impact on me. So all of that integration, which was started by these individuals, have led to what today we have as a number of important institutional clinical successes that involve emergency medicine, but not just emergency medicine. And that is the whole point. Things like this can only happen if groups were to get work together in an integrated fashion. So I'll just point a few of these. Our door to balloon time, if you have an acute myocardial infarction, it is absolutely marvelous. It's less than 60 minutes. Sometimes it's 30 minutes. And we're a chest pain center. All of these things can only happen with collaboration, integration, with melding these specialty towers. How do we do this? EMS, emergency medicine, cardiology. We are a comprehensive stroke center. How does that happen? That happens because EMS is taught how to recognize stroke. They call us and let us know very quickly a stroke is coming in. We activate our process, what we call a stroke code, with the Department of Neurology and with the Departments of Radiology. So everybody working together can get great things done. Of course, we're a level one trauma center, thanks to a lot of the work of George Sheldon and George Johnson. And that requires, again, close work between different towers, surgery, radiology, state EMS, and emergency medicine. Right now, we're only 5% of hospitals in the U.S. that employs hypothermia after resuscitation from cardiac arrest. And this is a marvelous technique because it raises the survival rate and intact neurologic survival to above 20%. But this is not easy to do because it requires a lot of cooperation. EMS to start hypothermia, the ED and the ED nurses, and then the CCU and the ICU to carry it on until the patient is fully recovered. We have an a, uh, institutional-wide anticoagulation reversal protocol. So as you know, many patients are on anticoagulants. If they come in with a condition that requires uh, reversal of anticoagulation until about six months ago, it, it was all mixed up. So the cooperation, though, of pharmacy, hematology, and emergency medicine, and probably neurosurgery as well, has helped us with this protocol. We have standardized methods and cooperation for treating sepsis. We have six years of collaboration with geriatric medicine, with education, training, and improving care in the community, and care in the nursing facilities after patients leave the hospital or the emergency department. And then emergency medicine is also critical to make sure that we meet some externally mandated metrics. There are core measures that we have to put in place for acute myocardial infarction and pneumonia, treatment within a certain specified amount of time. And we're also now working with many others in, in the institution to decrease hospital readmissions. And the re most recent data is we've had a 17% decrease in Blue Cross Blue Shield readmissions through reassessment in the emergency department rather than admitting them to the unit. So we've come a long way in the institution, that is for sure. Let me show you what kind of maturation we've had in emergency medicine, both regionally and nationally. By the early 2000s, there were 130 million ED visits a year in the U.S. 
But in North Carolina, 4 million ED visits. That's in a state with a population just about 9 million. Our program had eight residents per year, but in terms of medical student interest, we had become the fourth most popular specialty in the United States. In emergency medicine in the early 2000s, we already had EMS and pediatric EM fellowships. We have produced two state EMS medical directors. Trip Winslow, who is the current state medical director, is a UNC medical school grad, went to our residency, did our fellowship. He's faculty at Bowman Gray, but we still count him one of ours. We also, our residency graduates direct all of the first health ambulances. And one of our graduates who is here is the director of the Alamance County EMS system. And our resident or, and or fellowship graduates t direct Orange and White County EMS systems. And our graduates are medical directors of Maine Wake Med ED, Cary, e Wake Med Cary, and Rex Hospital as well, just to name a few. We produced two academic emergency medicine chairs out of our department. One of them was the chair of two departments. I guess I could say three chairs, but it's really only two. We have developed a statewide ED database, which tracks all of the visits to emergency departments throughout the state. And this same system does surveillance on communicable diseases. So th those of you here who are clinically active will probably see reports that come out on influenza, respiratory viruses, salmonella virus. This is all done by our department out of our southern village offices where our staff there under the direction of Dr. Anna Waller put together all this material and also Dr. Scholar and send it out to the State Division of Public Health. Also at UNC, we developed a statewide EMS database called PREMIS, and that became the foundation for an, a national EMS database called NEMSIS. And in two, two, 2003, our old sort of nemesis, the American Board of Medical Specialties, elected an emergency physician as their president. That was Harvey Meislin, who was chairman of the University of Arizona at Tucson. So how about today? Currently, we have 10 residents per year. There are over 160 emergency medicine residencies in the United States, with about 6,000 residents in training at any one time. Our own ED that started with 35,000 visits a year when we moved into the new facility now sees 80,000 adults. We have a separate, separate pediatric ED staffed by pediatric emergency physicians. That sees 25,000 children a year. We admit about 30% of all the patients who come into the ED and right now account for 52% of all the hospital admissions. We have new fellowships. We have a global health leadership fellowship, geriatrics, and a neurointensive care fellowship will be starting next year. Due to the work of Dr. Tom Griggs, our department has now taken over the medical directorship of the State Highway Patrol, and that same individual is also U.S. Army Reserve Medical Command. We've increased our number of contracts and grants, and Dr. Cairns, who has been a wonderful chair succeeding me, is now the PI of the North Carolina CDC Biosense Program. And he's really steered our department to a new, a new age, a new level of research. The NIH Office of Emergency Care Research was established in 2012, and Dr. Cairns was one of the three who worked tirelessly for three or four years to try to get that developed. And in 2014, guess what? The AMA president-elect, Stephen Stack, is an emergency physician. So I would say we have come a long way. Clinically, we've grown as well. So we've in improved our clinical practice within the emergency department. These aren't things that we do 
uh, we don't do all of these things at UNC, but they're done at many hospitals in the U.S., chest pain centers, observation units, critical care. We use ultrasound as a daily tool, and we do procedural sedation. So if you come in with a dislocated shoulder, we can really reduce it painlessly now. We have put in a lot of time nationally into academic research, and this slide just lists a few of the topics that are fairly common in emergency medicine research. But what's really exciting is we have, throughout the U.S., multi-center research consortia. PCARN is Pediatric Emergency Re uh, Consortium, the Net Stroke Network, which is uh, anchored at University of Michigan, is a hub of all the stroke research. The ROC is the Resuscitation Outcomes Consortium, which is in Dallas. And IDNet, which is probably the oldest one, is based out of uh, Los Angeles. We now have 110 full academic departments and nine international academic chairs. Emergency medicine gives subspecialty certificates, and they're listed here for you to see, the newest ones being EMS, critical care, and palliative care. So emergency medicine has grown a bit, and we've changed a little bit about the concepts of what we are. I mean, it used to be, well, you're in the ER, that's what you do, you work in this place, um, but our concepts have changed. We are a population-based specialty. We see all disorders, all ages, any day, any time. We provide care when other services fail. And of course, what we see reflects the age distribution and the illness distribution of the community. We see multiple patients at one time. When any of us go to see our primary care doctor or our internist or cardiologist, there's him or her and me, just two of us. But in the ED, as an attending, easily we'll be responsible for 30 patients at a time. So we have developed a way, a facility for caring for multiple patients at one time. And we do this through triage, where the nurses sort out people according to acuity. We have standing orders that uh, apply to different types of chief complaints so that blood tests are drawn and sometimes imaging is even started right at the triage area. We're used to multitasking, and I always laugh when I think I'll be talking on the phone. This is, this is a true scenario. I'll be talking on the phone, somebody's presenting to me in the other year, and then the EKG tech is handing me an EKG at the very same time. But that's the kind of multitasking we do. And then, of course, we coordinate care across specialty lines. We view ourselves as a management specialty because clinical skills are just not enough for an emergency physician. We have to have a lot of leadership and management skills. And sometimes we just have a natural aptitude for them, but more and more of our residency graduates are getting MBAs, Masters in Health Policy. And we develop standardized and integrated policies and procedures, and we supervise, and we make sure that these are all followed. And we use systems-based practice, and we've always used data to improve efficiency. We've had pretty much a fully electronic emergency department since 1996. With all of our records electronic, we could put data in, but the miracle was we could also get data out. We treat time-sensitive critical illness. And if you thought, well, what is an ER doc? That's what you would think he would do. And we treat time-critical illness, and many times it has to cross specialty lines. So heart attacks, strokes, accidents, behavioral emergencies, just some of the things that are really time-sensitive. And here's one of the important distinctions that um, public health students and faculty will understand. Emergency medicine has a high sensitivity for illness and injury, but other specialties typically want high specificity for the diseases in their domain. So cardiologists want to see heart disease. They're not really interested in non-cardiac chest pain. Surgeons, for example, want appendicitis. Orthopedists want broken bones. So emergency medicine takes all the cases, filters them out so that specialists can be more appropriately used. What about the next decade? 
The RAND Corporation recently released a report on emergency care in the next decade. In the next decade, they expect to see more of emergency medicine supporting primary care practices and doing more complex workups in the ED and providing more demand for after hours care. Based upon their work, which was done over the last two years, they came up with a surprising number. Depending on the hospital, EDs account nationally for 50 to 70 percent of hospital admissions. That's a huge amount and quite a change from the past when elective admissions accounted for most of the hospital population. So we are learning and doing and going to get better at playing a constructive role in constraining the growth of hospital admissions. And when you really get down to it, 130 million ER visits a year, not bad. I think it's a tacit measurement of our success. We have to remember that ED care is local care. I've talked about emergency medicine here in the state, in the United States. But remember, it is local. Patients in the ED are family, they're neighbors, they're friends, they're your patients from the clinics. And the emergency department is the front door to the hospital. We have to do better to get it patient-centered. And we know that hospital admissions from the emergency department are important for hospital success. The ED isn't just a set of rooms, it's a system. And we are heavily reliant on imaging, laboratory services, and consultants. And we're even more reliant on the inpatient flow from the hospital. It's a series of dominoes. You can't get them into a hospital bed if the hospital bed can't be vacated. Our major problems locally, nationally, and I will tell you this, worldwide, are problems of ED waiting time, sitting in the waiting room waiting for care, ED length of stay, time for processing, and time to get you into a bed, and ED boarding. The Australians and the New Zealanders have a word for that. They call it access block because it's it's endemic throughout the world. And to solve these problems requires a system approach. We have to do our part in the ED, but it requires a system approach with integrated solutions that we'll have to look at to do better at in the next decade. So we have some unfinished business to do. Everybody who reads The Economist, The New York Times, any other papers, will be inundated with talk about healthcare silos. I call them towers or domains. And the thing that we have to do in the future is break down these different domains and silos and towers of healthcare so that we can work much more effectively together. And actually, Dean Roper has now brought us to another fork in the road. And just as Dean Bondurant did, Dean Roper is leading us on the right path. Normally, when you think of domains or towers or silos, you think of the doctor silos. But these are not the only silos. I think we're doing a fairly good job of getting doctors of different specialties to work together. But there are many, many silos of care that have operated so independently that it's, it's our job for the future to get them all to work together. And I'm pleased to say that at least one way in which this is being done at UNC is through the development of integrated processes that Dean Roper has developed in order to get people to work together and have more integrated approach, a visionary approach to problems and where UNC healthcare needs to be in the next 10 years. And so there are two committees, a Center for Innovation and Healthcare System Transformation and the Medical Center Improvement Council that are set up to try to integrate all of these different towers of care. So I'm going to leave you with this slide and with this thought. Emergency medicine has found an absolutely wonderful home at UNC. And every day, I thank Stuart Bondurant for calling me that day. Remember, I was camping, and 
I was still in Michigan, and Stuart and I had to arrange a fixed time where I would be at the phone booth and where he would call me to let me know if he were offering me the job. Well, I knew I would take it the minute I met him. So, um, yeah. <laughs> you wanted to pay me less money, too. Yeah. <laughs> So emergency medicine has found a wonderful home at UNC. And UNC has been good for emergency medicine. Emergency medicine is good for the UNC healthcare system. And we all got where we are by thinking big, having grand ideas, and planning for the future. And I'm so proud to be part of a visionary, wonderful healthcare system. Thank you all.